Creeks Restoration and Water Quality Improvement Citizens Plan Advisory Committee to order. We'll start with roll call. Chair Hockman. Here. Mr. Jordan. Here. Mr. Moldaver. Here. Mr. Schluter. Here. Mr. Weber. Here. Mr. Wilson is not here yet. Ms. Longstreet. Here. And Mr. Josties and Ms. Falcone are not here yet as well. Wonderful. Item three, approval of, ooh, approval of minutes. Uh, November 12th. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? No, you don't. Doesn't matter. Okay, we have a second. Um, all in favor of approving? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Abstain. Okay, that's Mr. Weber. Um, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Okay, this would be the time that we have public comment where any member of the public could address our committee for up to a minute on any subject within our jurisdiction but not scheduled for public discussion. I have no speaker slips, so we will move on to item six, committee member and staff communications. Nothing from staff, no. nothing from committee members. Manager's report, item seven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have two things I wanted to report back to you this evening. Um, first, first of all, I wanted to give a update on the T fire and its, uh, its impact on uh, on the creeks and the, the areas of this committee's jurisdiction. Um, as you all know, on November 13th, a, a fire broke out on East Mountain Drive. Uh, high winds that evening, up to 70 miles per hour, uh, whipped the fire through the, uh, through the canyon. I have a slide here that I wanted you all to take a look at because I think it really uh, graphically demonstrates uh, how significant this fire was on one of the major uh, creek systems in the city, and that's Sycamore Creek. And you can see here we've got the, the different watersheds uh, outlined in different colors. This is Mission Creek Watershed, Laguna, um, this is Cold Springs, and this blue one here is the Sycamore Creek Watershed. The red outline here is the fire outline. And you can see it, it almost swallows the entire Sycamore Creek watershed. Uh, in fact, out of 1,940 acres burned in the fire, uh, 1,670 acres of that was in Sycamore Canyon, or excuse me, Sycamore Creek watershed. And that's about si almost 70% of the, of the entire watershed burned. So uh, in, in addition to the tragic uh, consequences for people living up in that area and the loss of 230 homes. Uh, there are significant impacts to the watershed and the environment there, including, including water quality and habitat impacts. Um, the, the most significant of those impacts is, is erosion. As you all know, uh, sediment is identified in the city stormwater management program as a pollutant of concern. Uh, Research on post-fire, especially in hillside areas like this, shows that in the first years after a, after a wildfire, you can have erosion levels that are three orders of magnitude greater than uh, normal background levels of erosion. And so uh, I wanted to report to you all s some of the efforts that the city has been working on in conjunction with the county flood control district uh, Caltrans and private landowners up in the area to try to mitigate that, er that potential for erosion. First of all, there was uh, immediately after the fire was contained, we had a forecast for significant, a fairly significant rain event uh, to come with approximately within a week of the fire. Um, the forecast was for an inch and a half of rain down in the lower areas and up to three inches of rain up in the, up in the mountains. Uh, we began work with the county flood control district on some vegetation clearing from the from the creek. The clearing uh, occurred on the on the be creek bed and on the lower banks of the creek, approximately two to three feet up the banks. Uh, two existing debris basins were excavated. One is in par in the city's Parma Park. Uh, it's a, a pretty significant debris basin. I think it's a thousand cubic yards of sediment was removed to the from that, that's a, a remnant debris basin from the Coyote 
uh, or the, excuse me, the Sycamore Canyon fire that has filled with sediment over the years. So it was excavated out to make room for additional sediment coming in. Uh, and also a debris basin um, at the intersection, uh, along the creek at the intersection of Coyote Road and Sycamore Canyon Road. Uh, the city also performed some hydro mulching up in uh, Parma Park. And the hydro mulch is, is sprayed from hoses and from trucks onto the soil to try to uh, mitigate or prevent erosion. Um, two debris racks were installed, one at Parma Park, near the Parma Park entrance at Stanwood Drive, and one near Coyote Road at Sycamore Canyon Road. And those are sort of up there in the upper watershed, and they're designed to catch large debris and large boulders before, it, before they move down the creek channel and plug one of the the culverts are underneath one of the bridges and cause uh, additional damage. And then lastly, uh, I wanted to let you know, we, as you know, we do stormwater quality uh, monitoring. We, we did go out uh, after the fire in that storm and, and collect some samples, so we will have some, uh, some idea of what the impact of the, the fire and the runoff was on, on water quality. Oftentimes with uh, wildfires, you find uh, a change in pH. Uh, the ash is, uh, is really basic, so you, ch you have a change in pH. And also, oftentimes, we find uh, higher concentrations of heavy metals. And we are still waiting the results from those samples. But um, as I mentioned in my report, we also took some samples in Mission Creek watershed so that we had kind of a control uh, to compare them to. So uh, so that's it on the fire. I just want to give you a heads up on some of the things that had been, had been going on. And secondly, I wanted to mention that, um, as I described in my report and sent out to you with your packets, the Plan Santa Barbara uh, general plan update is going to city council tomorrow. And there will be a city council meeting on the, on the draft policy preferences tomorrow from 9 to 1 here in City Council Chambers, and then again on Tuesday, December 16th from 6 to 9 p.m. And what I wanted to say about that, this, this committee has been involved in this process now for just over a year. I looked back to when we held our first workshop to talk about this, and it was November 26th of last year. We submitted a letter, or the committee submitted a letter to the Planning Division outlining a, a range of issues that the committee would like to see considered in the general plan update. Uh, that letter was sent December 5th of, of 2007. And um, having reviewed what is being presented by the, the community development uh, staff to council tomorrow, I think all of the issues that the committee raised are incorporated into this, uh, in, into this draft policy preferences report. Um, the stage that this is at is the council is, is preparing to uh, they're, they're in a scoping stage. They're preparing to begin a programmatic environmental impact report. And there will be subsequent scoping meetings for the public to look at what council uh, ultimately puts forward as the scope of the document. There will be, uh, pursuant to state law, some scoping meetings so that people can come in and look at that and identify any areas that, are, that were not included in the scope. The scope is very, very broad uh, on this, uh, in this proposal. And um, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you have on either of those items. All right, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just wondering on that uh, on that slide you had with the uh, with the fire zone, if um, if it's kind of the the things you described were kind of the big picture uh, assessments and remedies. But are, are are we interested, or are we making any attempts to actually get out and uh, and cherry pick? on uh, private property restoration opportunities within our own program. So that'd be one question. And the second question would be, if we are going to do that too, is there additional, uh, as it was declared both a federal and a state disaster area, are there additional uh, funds that could be driven to our existing program for that purpose? Uh, 
I'll take the second question first. What I what I understand from um, communications with FEMA and with the State Office of Emergency Services with regard to uh, emergency funding is that there's emergency funding available for for response to these emergencies. Uh, I think there will be. Uh, they, they've suggested that the city apply for reimbursement for hydro mulching. They've told us specifically that there would not be funds available for any kind of uh, revegetation effort. So, um, so that's the answer to the to the funding part of the question. Uh, I have been in communication with the Santa Barbara Contractors Association and the um, uh, local chapter of the AIA, as well as some uh, landscape architects in in the community, to let them know that the. Creeks Division does have a program or creek tree, a creek tree planting program for Creekside property owners. Uh, we have been uh, working to communicate with the Community Environmental Council, who is who, along with the AIA and the Contractors Association, are hosting an event this Saturday in Montecito at the Montecito Covenant Church from nine to one. It's called From Ashes to Opportunity. Focus there is is on a range of uh, green building practices, so that as people go back in and rebuild, they can do things better than they had before. And we, we would like to make sure that the the information about our program is available to uh, to those residents who are eligible for the program. I guess that uh, it's a suggestion I would toss out then, because I know we've already kind of hashed over this on the on the tree program, but given the uh, the scope and the, the level of what took place up there, um, it, it would be nice to see if the division could be receptive to uh, opportunities to get in there and expand that program beyond trees, maybe also including vegetation. And if and if that conversation were to come up, you know, in in one of these meetings or in discussions that you're having, that 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 could be brought back to the advisory committee and and. And we could actually see if we could go somewhere with that, with our funding, or it just seems like such an opportunity to actually do some uh, some baseline work rather than have to tear something down and rebuild it, right? Okay, thanks. Thanks. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right, Mr. Wilson. <clears throat> thanks, Chair. I would like to uh, second Committee Member Jordan's recommendation that this is a prime opportunity for Creeks Division to step up, lend a hand, and great use of Measure B funds for water quality, private property help. Okay, I appreciate that. And as, as the chair is just about to say, I think we don't we don't have that item on the agenda, so we, we can't take any action on that. But if, uh, if that uh, situation presents itself, we will be back to the committee to have that discussion. Thanks. All right. Wonderful. Okay. Then we'll move on to our subcommittee reports. Item eight, we did have a subcommittee meeting. It was education and outreach. And I think we will have Mr. Benson give us an idea of what we did. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. You were there. Um, yes, the education outreach subcommittee met on November 24th to discuss the update of the public education plan, uh, looking at results from our 2008 public opinion survey we had the the survey consultant and and one of his partners who is a community-based social marketing consultant uh, come up from Los Angeles uh, to meet with us at no cost uh, to provide input for for potential changes and for, and things that they saw in the public opinion survey um, since we had these two consultants present we we used the meeting time mostly to hear from them to uh, um, listen to their analysis of the survey results and uh, basically gathering information from them. We didn't get as far as we wanted to on our own agenda, which was actually moving forward on, on uh, suggested amendments to the public education plan, but we agreed that uh, listening to what they had to say was important, and since they had come a long way, it was, uh, it was a, I think, a good use of our time, and we agreed to meet. Uh, at some point in the future. So no no action was taken at the meeting and we will have a subsequent meeting to move forward with proposed changes. Good. And now we will move on to our business items. Uh, 
uh, agenda item number 9A, Mission Creek Fish Passage Project, the Caltrans Channel. We have George Johnson to present. All right, hello everyone. I'll try, I'm gonna cover a lot of information, so it'd help, be helpful if you just could wait with questions uh, and just write them down, so you may have a lot. I'll try to go through as quick as I can, so I don't bore you guys, but there is a lot of information to cover, so. Um, the first thing, basically this project is covering the Mission Creek Steelhead Recovery Project at the Caltrans Channel. That's what we're gonna be focusing on and, and specifically the modeling results. We just finished that modeling. Um, and as well as an agreement that we're working out with uh, Santa Barbara County Flood Control. Sorry. So this first picture here is just a, a steelhead that's actually in Mission Creek that was trying to spawn below the Caltrans Channel. Um, you can see the cleared area where the, um, there's no moss. And I'm just gonna give you a quick uh, overview of, of steelhead trout. They live in both fresh and salt water, so they go out to the ocean for part of their life or a, a large part of their life. They usually live the first year of their life in the streams. That's where they're born and then they swim out after that and then they grow large and uh, come back up the streams in order to spawn. Um, they typically in Southern California migrate during the winter and spring. That's you know when we have water in the creeks and what's kind of unusual about this species is that they can spawn more than once, unlike um, salmon. Excuse me. Um, in terms of their range, uh, steelhead trout, you can see in this photo, that's, that's their historic range. And they pretty much have the same range as they did before. I'm not quite sure if there's still steelhead in those lower areas in Mexico, but um, they do, uh, they do cover a lot of the area that they historically did, but the big difference here is that uh, a su the subspecies, Southern California steelhead trout, that's been designated by the National Marine Fishery Service as endangered, it has really reduced in its population size. In fact, it's, as that says, less than 1% of its former population, and, and that's a huge reduction. And mostly that's been done because of uh, steelhead threats that, it, you know, due to human reasons, we've uh, kind of developed their habitat and uh, degraded it through both um, water quality and then through blocking um, migration. And you can see in this photo on the right, you see that dirty water coming in there, this concrete channel, that bridge, there's no way fish can spawn there. They couldn't probably live in that water, it's so dirty and, there's, and they can't get above that structure to, to better spawning habitat. So that's typical of a lot of areas in Southern California, what's been done to, the, to streams as due to urbanization. And then this photo here shows another bridge crossing where it's difficult for steelhead trout to migrate upstream. So again, degraded habitat's probably one of, the, one of the big reasons, but probably more important is migration barriers because they can deal with some of those other things like poor water quality sometimes, but if they can't get upstream to where they spawn, then there's no babies born and the species pretty much dies out of that stream. Next, uh, project purposes, you can see here, that's a fish that died a couple of years ago below the Caltrans Channel, possibly due to water quality or predation, it's not quite sure, but um, that fish was not able to get upstream. You know, I think it's like 26 or 28 inches, it's a big fish, it's unfortunate. And so the purpose is to try to restore a healthy population in Mission Creek and improve steelhead trout migration, obviously, is what we need to do to get that population back. This specific project would remove or modify the largest barrier on Mission Creek, and that's the Caltrans Channel, and we'll go over that in a little bit. And uh, by doing that, as well as removing a couple other uh, barriers that the city's currently working on, we'd be, we'd be opening up almost four miles of habitat um, for the steelhead trout. And so that's a pretty big step in getting the species back on Mission Creek. This map's gonna be a little hard to see. I was hoping it would be a little better to see in the large format, but if you see these two lines, these dark lines, this is basically, first off, this is the watershed. It's just an outline of Mission Creek watershed. These two lines right here are the Caltrans channels themselves. And then each one of these little numbers are different barriers with different severity along the creek. By removing or modifying the Caltrans channel, we'll be able to get the fish all the way up to about here on Rattlesnake. And I think to here, it's hard for me to see on main Mission Creek channel. And so that's, from this point up there is about four miles, also if you include this little bit of habitat between the two channels. And two of that, if you could, uh, it's really hard to see the coloration, but right about here at the, at the History Museum, that's what that um, MH7, I think, represents, or MN7. 
that was a barrier there that was removed already. From there upward is what's considered um, medium to high quality habitat by the Conception Coast study that was done by Matt Stecker. And so that's, that's the two mile area from here, which is basically the Natural History Museum, above the Highway 192 bridge um, and up Rattlesnake, maybe a quarter of a mile, and then up Mission Canyon all the way to the, uh, the, the old dam at the Botanical Gardens. This is just a picture of some of the fish that we saw in 2008. It's interesting to note that Mission Creek had six uh, fish over 16 inches, and that tied probably for second in all of Southern California for the most fish that were, were trying to get up any of the streams. The one that exceeded that was the San Inez River. I'm not sure which one it tied with. It may have been the Ventura River, but um, just, to, just to let you know, there are a lot of fish trying to get up Mission Creek, so it is an important stream to try to restore the uh, species on. Here's just a, a, a quick view of the actual barriers that the city's working on right now. Again, here's the Caltrans Channel. Here's the barrier at Talent Road. It's that upstream end of Oak Park. And for those of you who went on the tour, you're probably familiar with these, and then the one at the 192 bridge. This is the Caltrans Channel. For any of you who haven't seen it, it's a mile long. It's con all concrete, trapezoidal channel. There's two sections, one three-fourths of a mile and one a quarter of a mile long. And they're separated by about a... 4.4 mile um, gap of natural channel in between it. Uh, the fish can't get up this. It, when, it lo and when it's a low flow like this, after a small rain event, it's too shallow. And when it, and the flow gets higher, um, it's just too fast and too long. Fish just get tired out, so they, they can't get up the channel. Um, project history, there's been a lot of talk about the project for quite a while, but things seem to really get moving along in 2005 when the Environmental Defense Center um, hired the um, Northwest Hydraulics to come up with some cost-effective designs for getting fish back through this channel. There was talk of removing the whole channel, but that price tag was so high, anywhere from 30 to $15 million, it kind of threw that option out. So they wanted to see if there were some more cost-effective options. The city actually applied for a CDFG grant in 2006 also, was successful in getting that. And so, and the grant was to do some flume model testing, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, the results. We hired NHC, Northwest Hydraulics Consultants, in 2007 to do that flume model testing, and we completed that this fall and have a final report now. So here's a picture of the flume model. Flume's just a, a, a channel that you run water through, and we put various uh, um, models within that that were scaled, exact replicas of different reaches of the creek. There were three reaches that we looked at, one at the Cannon Perdido Bridge, one at the Arriaga Street Bridge, and one at the Mission Street Bridge. Um, we looked at five different designs over the testing, and the issues that we were focusing on were fish passage, obviously sedimentation within the channel, and then flood elevations. Here's the design alternative that was developed originally in 2006 by NHC. There were three of them. They were all pretty similar to this. They involved either taking half or all of this bottom channel out, lowering it about four feet, and then putting another concrete slab in, and then placing large boulders, as you can see here, in that concrete slab. The idea is the boulders were to provide resting areas and reduce the flow rate so that the fish could swim upstream. And they were actually, in our model testing, successful at doing that. So the fish passage was actually successful. Sorry, I didn't want to go there. But the problem was that uh, by slowing the water down, they raised flood elevations, reducing the capacity of the channel. So that it has problems for future flooding events. And, and the slowing down and the roughness of the channel created a lot of sedimentation problems. Actually, when we did the sediment test, the whole, those whole channels filled with sediment. So it really didn't provide a very good uh, um, fish passage at that point once they were filled with sediment, and uh, there's a large maintenance problem. So we had to come up with, midway through the project, some new design alternatives, and that's where this comes in place. Uh, one of them was this, which in your staff report is called Alternative 5, or Side Pockets, and there was another one, Alternative 4. They were a little bit similar, and they both had low flow channels cut into the bottom of the channel, of the main flood control channel, and that's about four feet wide to scale. Um, 
and and then the alternative four actually had small weirs or little dams every 40 feet along and those were designed to provide resting areas and pools for the fish to rest behind and then swim up and reduce velocities within that low flow channel this idea was to provide resting areas to the side of the channel in what's called side pockets so those were cut into the side of the channel same depth about 10 feet long and two and a half feet wide to scale and the fish could swim the 40 feet where the where the water's flowing faster than get in here and rest swim the next one swim to the next one that's the idea um, both of them were tested in the Cannon Perdido reach of the model and uh, the first alternative four that I talked about before with the dams or weirs didn't really work very well because it, it filled with sediment and didn't create the pools or the resting areas that the fish needed so we had to throw that one out and um, when we looked at this one it actually didn't have the same sedimentation problems and uh, and I'll go over some of the the particulars next this we looked at those three criteria again fish passage being the first one this just shows some red dye in the side pocket and that just indicates that there's not much flow going on in that creek I mean in that section of the of the pocket you, there's a lot of flow going in here um, but right there there's no flow and that's what we wanted we wanted to try to provide a place where there's no flow so that the fish can rest without having to swim you know having a difficult time uh, swimming upstream and uh, they worked well even during large flood events this, the uh, resting area and there the velocities were very low so even giant flood events that the fish typically wouldn't swim up it was low enough for the fish to rest there and then at the lower flows within the channel itself um, the velocities were low enough for the fish to actually get through that low flow channel and he, for most of the blow, flows below 75 CFS which is cubic feet per second if you don't know what that is um, and then this is uh, shows the sedimentation it here's the side pocket and these things right here are little speed bumps I guess that's the best way to explain them um, and they were put in in our um, uh, in this alternative or this design alternative in order to create more depth within the low flow channel during real low flows of water that allows the fish to swim up when the, there's not much water in the channel and you can see the sedimentation this is really all that was left after we did the sediment test it's not very much it still provides enough area for the fish to rest and stills allow them allows them to get up the channel so sedimentation proved not to be a problem with this with this alternative and then flood elevations we tested anywhere from 10 CFS to 5200 and 5200 being the flood of record on Mission Creek and that's or about the flood of record as best as we could tell from the 95 storms um, fish wouldn't move up at that but we tested it for flood elevation reasons and what we found was that uh, through all the testing in all the reaches we didn't we didn't it didn't indicate any reduction in channel capacity so that was important we were not increasing any flooding risks associated with modifying the channel and that's basically the report conclusions uh, everybody involved we had a lot of resource agencies go up and, and actually watch the flume model testing and discuss it and, you know try to get you know come up with alternative designs and, and all those things and and the report concluded as you can read here that the test results indicate that alternative five would provide adequate velocity reductions without adversely impacting channel capacity and adequate velocity reduction means for the fish to swim upstream and then while some sediment accumulation would occur in the fishway maintenance is expected to be minor and infrequent that's kind of the final conclusion of the report that leads us to the next uh, subject of the uh, meeting tonight and that's on the agreement we are currently working with flood control they own the channel although it was called the Caltrans channel it was built by Caltrans the flood control district owns it and maintains it currently so in order to do any work in that channel the city needs to get permission and we're working with them to get formal permission on that um, the agreement will outline the various responsibilities who's going to maintain it what's going to happen when we construct it those things and uh, and so we're as I said we're working with flood control on that and uh, trying to move that forward with uh, just to mention there may be some questions on maintenance and what the costs are we don't really know what the costs are we'll know better when we do preliminary plans but because there's so little maintenance seen in the in the flume model testing we anticipate that to be pretty low in terms of the cost for maintenance to remove that sediment and the concrete and all the other hard structures we build they will probably outlast the main channel since they'll be newer <laughs> so we don't anticipate having to replace that anytime soon um, the agreement timeline uh, it, we are 
tentatively looking at going to the city council to get approval of the agreement with the flood control board, flood control district board, and that would be on January 13th, and then we would take it to the flood control district on January 27th for their approval. In terms of funding, of the model testing cost $213,000 total. Uh, we had that grant from the Department of Fish and Game, which was 155,000. The Environmental Defense Center, through a, a private um, Annenberg grant, uh, provided us $44,000 for the model testing, and then the Creeks Division um, supplied about $14,000, mostly for travel for the agency representatives. Preliminary final design is the next step in the process after we get this agreement, and that um, those costs are, we have $135,000 right now from EDC. We're unsure what the final cost will be for preliminary design. We won't know that until we send out an RFP. But the Creeks Division capital budget also has $185,000, and we did last year apply for a grant from the Department of Fishing Game for a, a, um, half a million dollars to finish preliminary and final design. So we do think we have the funding. It's unsure yet whether we'll get that extra CDFG funding, but we, we do, it does look like we have enough to at least get through preliminary design, and we should. So the next steps are to finish the agreement, as we talked about, um, complete preliminary design, and then go on into the CEQA, and then after that, final design. Um, but that's still a ways down the road. Um, so tonight, I just want to remind you what, what staff is asking is that the, at the committee recommend that council authorize staff to enter into an agreement with the Santa Barbara County Flood Control District to modify the Caltrans channel to allow fish passage and maintain the project as necessary. Questions? I'll try to run this video <laughs> of the steelhead that we saw in February of 2008. Well, and you guys are welcome to start. I, I think I was going to, since we have public comment, I was going to open to public comment. Okay, first. Uh, that's great. And and Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Mulligan. To, to frame the public comment, just for the sake of discussion, uh, I would actually like to move that the committee recommend to the City Council that they authorize the staff to uh, complete the agreement within the parameters uh, and the financial expectations outlined by Mr. Johnson in his presentation today. So there is a motion on the table. Is there a second for it? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We'll move into discussion, and in that discussion, we'll start with public comment. We have Brian Troutwine from the EDC. Thank you very much, and good evening, Mr. Chair and committee members. I'm Brian Troutwine from the Environmental Defense Center. We're the city's nonprofit partner in this wonderful project, a very large and wonderful project. And uh, we did certainly support the motion to move forward with working with the <coughs> wanted to highlight that the project has benefited from numerous grants and EDC has received four grants so far. It's a very fundable project. Oh. And we uh, intend to continue seeking and obtaining grants to work with the city and complete this project, see it actually implemented in the ground so we can see more than the flu model test and we actually can actually see the project implemented. With that, we do support the staff recommendation and the motion on, on the floor. And again, look forward to working with the city until this is complete, and if you have any questions about EDC's role in the project, I'd certainly be happy to answer. Yeah. And Mr. Chair, I, I, I did. Yes, Mr. Muldaren. Um, not everyone on the committee is aware that Mr. Troutwine, at a young age, founded the local chapter of the Urban Creeks Council, and more than almost any other person in the ninth scientific field has been instrumental uh, in keeping the issue of the channel restoration for steelhead alive and in the public attention. And he's done that diligently and with innovation and a great sense of style, which contributed about 10 years ago to him being named the outstanding undergraduate graduate from UCSB's Environmental Studies program. So the assistance that he's brought to this project through EDC is simply a continuation of a lifelong passion for uh, steelhead, for urban creeks, and for their ecology. And I want to use this last meeting before the holidays to thank and commend you and uh, the EDC board and staff for the example that you've set. I know it inspires everyone on this committee. Well, thank you, and thanks to the city. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Lee said it better than I would have. And so we very much appreciate the help the EDC is giving on this project and the support. and. Um, so we'll now move on to discussion of the motion that's on the table. And let's go with Mr. Schluter. George, good, good presentation. I have some 
varying questions. First, do we have any estimate at all on the population of the steelhead trout in the in the Mission Creek? Well, there, you know, as I said, in 2008 we had six uh, fish over 16 inches travel upstream um, and try to get up above the Caltrans channel. They were not able to, so some of them attempted to spawn in that lower channel. We don't think that was successful due to the water quality conditions down there. It just gets too warm and the oxygen levels get too low. But there are rainbow trout, which are the same species. They just aren't, they just for some reason didn't go to the ocean like the steelhead, the steelhead version. Um, Nobody knows why. Some of the rainbow trout will live their whole life cycle in the freshwater, and others will swim out to the ocean and turn into steelhead. Um, so there are a number of uh, rainbow trout in Mission Creek. I don't know how many in the hundreds, probably, I would say, is a rough estimate. But actual steelhead, uh, there aren't any except the few that tried to come up this, you know, that try to come up every year. They, they live their life out in the ocean and then only come up to spawn. So, so, so there is a... Although minimal, there is a, a, an ongoing sustained population yes, of these guys. Of, of, of rainbow trout, which like, yes, exactly. And of the steelhead. So that yep. this project will be, in, when it's in place, there will be a population to use it. Yep, we hope so. <laughs> I mean, there are right now, but you, you never know. They're, they're very, the numbers are very low. Like we, we said, less than 1% for the Southern California do you population. Have, do you have any estimate at all of when the project would be complete? Well, we, we would tr our, our hope is to try to do the upper channel in 2011 and then finish the lower channel in 2012 because we're going to do it in a two-tiered construction approach. We want to learn from the first one. And when was the longer channel put in originally? It was put in in the 60s, and the old one was put in in the 30s, the upper one. So these barriers have been there a long time. Long time. And we still have sustainable yeah. population. So and there, there, there are is good fish, rationale for this then. Fish from other streams do, uh, do try to go up. It's not, they're not like salmon where they're exclusive to one stream. Uh -huh. So if, if we, there are some that are successfully spawning in like the San Inez River and the Ventura River and things, those fish could theoretically use this once it's available. All right, thank you. Uh, Committee Member Schluter, I'd just like to to clarify one thing. You used a, a word uh, used a word differently. One time you said uh, sustainable population. One time you said a sustained population. And I think what we see is a sustained population of fish. Uh, there, the the rainbow trout. Uh, I think the the regulatory agencies consider the the rainbow trout in the upper portion of the watershed to be um, I guess the the best way I'd characterize it is potential steelhead. If they have the genetic uh, makeup to to make them anadromous so that they go down and they live part of their life in the ocean, then they will continue to come back. And so, uh, but trying to look at a sustainable population, you know, as you know, as that genetic pool continues to shrink, the p population becomes less and less sustainable all the time. So yes, there's a sustained population over time with those with those barriers in place but we don't know when we cross the line and the, the population is no longer uh, sustained in, the, in Mission Creek. Uh, yes, I used a technical word probably too loosely. My apologies. And, and one other, one, and to give also to the point of your question is, what, you know, one question that we have is what is the capacity? We don't, we don't know exactly what the historic levels of steelhead were in Mission Creek, and we, we do want to get a better answer as to what is the uh, the potential capacity for for steelhead uh, and we we intend to do that as part of our process as we're going forward and at some point before we get to a construction decision on this project do you, to follow with that point it do um, is it possible to do a, a, I don't want to use a, an improper word here, but a survey account or something so you can quantify a recovering population or is that too hard to count them? Well, the idea is you, you couldn't you actually count fish, but you can look at habitat and size and try to make an estimate as to how many fish that the stream could sustain, steelhead and then fry, because they come up and the fry are the small fish that live there for the first year of their life. And you can get an estimate of, you know, how many could you support in this creek given the depth of the pools and the size of the habitat area and, and all those things. And then that should give you an idea of, how many fish you might be able to get coming back each year and what kind of population okay, you get. Okay, so you can estimate what the environment could sustain, but uh, 
kind of like it's carrying How many capacity. actually there is is difficult, if not impossible, to ascertain. Yeah, I mean, we could do snorkel surveys of every pool and get an exact number, but uh, I don't know what that would get us. Uh, my next question is uh, more out of curiosity than direct this purpose. On the, on the picture of the dead fish, you mentioned predation. I would assume, the, you know, are hawks the pred predators? Mm, uh, most likely, they think it would be something like a uh, like a heron, either a night heron or a egret or a great blue heron, something like that, that would stab the fish and then try to eat a portion of it. I don't really know. Um, I, there was a photo that we got from the harbor, and it showed what appeared to be a steelhead in an o in osprey that was holding had had gotten it out out of the harbor last year, I think. So they would probably be in the ocean uh, predation. You know, would 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 uh, try to get steelhead, but in the creek, not quite sure. Uh, my biggest concern, technically, is this question of sedimentation. And you mentioned in in the model studies that you had looked at sedimentation. Uh, I know a little bit about scaling and flume testing, but I know that sedimentation is very difficult, if not impossible, to do. So I'm, I'm dubious about making any conclusions about sedimentation from the flume modeling. Right. Well, I think the best response to that is that uh, we were comparing it to other alternatives. So it was kind of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. These other alternatives, we could see that there was obviously sedimentation issues. And this one, it appeared that there weren't. There is no guarantee that there won't be any sedimentation problems, but watching the water flow, that you, you know, you get pretty good flow through that low flow channel, and it seems because of the hard bottoms and the concrete, that any sediment and and large uh, larger cobble and things that get in the channel seem to tumble right through it. Now we'll see what happens in real life, but the the main point I wanted to make was that. Uh, the way that this has been designed is that if there is maintenance associated with it, it's pretty straightforward in terms of doing it. It doesn't require a lot of hand labor. We can use a backhoe. The bottom is all pretty much flat, and there's a large area to the side of the channel. Um, if you look here to where a truck can be driven, there's truck access throughout the whole channel. So you could actually drive a backhoe o right over the top of the channel get a bucket in there, scoop out the sediment, put it in a truck, and go right on down the line. So even if sedimentation did, on a particularly large storm, you know, fill up the channel for some reason, it wouldn't be very expensive to clear it out. And so that's, that's why we think that we're pretty confident that it's not going to be a huge cost. It would seem to me that before it got to the point where a backhoe would be the appropriate maintenance tool, that if you took one of the city water trucks and just flushed sediment when there wasn't very much there uh, and not let it build up to the point where you required a backhoe, but just flush it out manually on, on the odd occasion, Yeah, that might be a cheaper alternative. It, it, it might. It, it, it brings up some water quality issues where, where typically the agencies don't like to see us spraying out sediment within the stream channel, so that might be difficult from a permitting standpoint. And then um, what we think when there will be sedimentation problems is when you get a big episodic event where you get bed load material actually moving. Right. So li little less frequently and probably wouldn't be able to get there in there at that interim time. You know, it happened during the storm event and then once it recedes, we'd say, oh, our channel's filled with sediment kind of thing. So, you know, we can take that into consideration, but there may be some Yeah, that's a detail that you can say yeah. later. Uh, my understanding is, if I remember correctly from your last presentation, that this idea of the side pockets has not is not a proven technique that's been applied elsewhere, is that Yes, correct? this is correct. It hasn't been used anywhere that we know of. Um, there is one channel, uh, Corta Madera, I think, in Northern California, that's used something similar to a low flow channel, but it's a, a little different. And they're talking, I think, about using this on in Goleta. Is that true? Yeah, in San Jose Creek, a, a similar design, but it hasn't been proven anywhere. OK. How did you decide on? Um, channel width, channel depth, pocket size. Did you evaluate a series of alternatives, or did you pick one that seemed right and go with the testing? I'll, I'll let Cameron answer that one. Uh, we, we, we did a survey of all the uh, available literature we could find as to what people think fish are looking for when they're trying to migrate up a stream. And we... Uh, we tried to, you know, we had some constraints that we were working with uh, with regard to the flood control district who wanted us to keep a, keep a wide enough apron here so that they could get their trucks 
up and down the channel still. And so, uh, as George just mentioned, part of our part of our maintenance design consideration was um, being able to take a dump truck along here. Uh, the channel width is um, uh, can can handle the the wheelbase of a of a standard backhoe. So you can actually drive a backhoe uh, straddled over that channel and and pick it up and dump right into a dump truck as you're going as you're moving along the channel. Um, we we were also looking at uh, in Santa Barbara we have more low flows than we do high flows. So what what we were looking at in sizing was uh, a, a size sufficient to to make a fish comfortable to move up, but also uh, sufficient to concentrate water so that we had you know, the nine inches of depth that we were looking for to, to allow a fish to move up, move up the low flow channel under, you know, the, the largest possible window we could open. So we have more, we have low flows at the, at the uh, beginning and at the end of the storm events. And so uh, this, this sizing gave, kind of worked for all of those different, okay. um, all of those different areas. And then the spacing between the side pockets, we were looking at, at burst speeds and and length of time a fish can make it up and the length of the whole channel and trying to trying to conform to what we had in terms of the, the scientific data. Okay, uh, hey, Mr. Okay. Schluter, I'm going to try and mix it up a little bit. Oh, get okay. back to you for another round if you've got more. Does anyone else on the committee have Mr. Wilson? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, George. Very uh, clear presentation. Uh, very informative too. Uh, I, again, the biggest question, obviously, is regarding sedimentation. A lot of unknowns there, and I'm wondering, did uh, did uh, was the study able to bring any of varying size Santa Barbara sediment, cobble, gravel, or anything up to the flume and actually see how it performed? Or well, um, uh, interesting that you asked that. They we we didn't use actual material from Mission Creek uh, when we were first doing the testing. The material that they were using was a little uh, uh, not so round in shape as typical of Santa Barbara. It was more you know a lot more edges and jagged than than the stuff that we typically see here. So we asked them to change it to a little rounder um, kind of gravel um, in order to simulate you know what we actually see here, but. It's, it's again, with like sedimentation, it's, sizes. oh yeah, we did have varying sizes. We actually did it uh, according to uh, an Army Corps of Engineers had done core tests of the Mission Creek channel, and then they related that to the bed load with some modeling, and so that's how we determined how much sediment was actually put into the stream channel along a hydrograph for a typical storm. And so that was generated from Army Corps of Engineer data, and then our engineers at NHC you know, developed the curve, and then that's how we put the sediment in. But the actual shape, as I said, when we were first doing it, was a little more jagged, and then we got the rounder stuff. But with, with both versions, we didn't see um, a lot of uh, sedimentation in this particular version. Great. Two more quick questions, and related to that, when the velocity barrier, the high velocity barrier happening, is happening, and nice to see Matt just came in. Um, uh, typically, what sort of uh, sediment or bed load is moving moving when the velocity barrier is achieved? Oh, that would or, be hard. Or is there currently always a velocity barrier once there's enough water for a fish to even move? It's just going to be too high velocity to begin it, with. You know, at about 100 CFS is where it gets a little difficult for this particular uh, um, model for fish to swim up. You know, the burst speed for that 40 feet gets a little difficult according to what the biologists are telling the fish can do. So. Anything over 100 CFS would be difficult, and at 100 CFS, you're not going to get a lot of bed material uh, moving at that point. Probably more around 500, if I had to guess. You know, so quite a bit higher before you start getting a lot of bed load Thank material you. moving. And then the, uh, you will have fine sediments, though. The, but the golden question is, what will the maintenance agreement look like? Will it be uh, city creeks, uh, city of Santa Barbara, county flood control? Who will pay, and is you know what sort of anticipations? might we all prepare for I think mr. Benson would like to have a shot at that that's part of the that's part of the agreement that that we are working on with the flood control district and ultimately would have to uh, uh, would ultimately be approved by the City Council and flood control district board but um, what we're looking at generally speaking is the flood control districts uh, 
the, the flood control district maintains the channel in its current form. They don't have a debris removal issue because the water moves so fast over the channel, there's no place for uh, debris to get caught. I mean, it's just smooth concrete. Again, that was in designing this, this type of design, it's a smooth concrete low flow channel. The reason that you get some sediment is we've slowed the water down a little bit in that, in that section, so you get a little bit of sediment that drops out. Uh, we think from the modeling that that's, that that's going to be limited, but whatever sediment does drop out and in, into that low flow channel would be the city's responsibility. And um, the, the flood control district will maintain its responsibility for maintaining its part of the channel, but the part that has changed would become the city's responsibility for maintenance. That's clear. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I know Mr. Jordan had something. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of questions. Um, uh, one comment, I, I, I guess I have the same concern Mr. Schlitter mentioned on, because uh, I had that question on uh, lack of uh, successful evidence somewhere else that if you build it, the fish will actually go in that side pocket. So I realize there's an element of faith in this. Um, the, uh, does the, uh, the status of Steelhead itself uh, preclude the possibility of uh, some other municipality or government agency ever building another barrier up above this particular project and circumventing this project? Well, we have Matt McGugan here from the National Marine Fisheries Service, and so they, they pretty much oversee any time something's constructed in a creek where there is steelhead habitat. As far as I know, it would be virtually impossible to do that at this stage since it's considered an endangered species. Okay, good. And then uh, I'm happy it's December. I'd like to ask my last really dumb question of the year. And that's, um, is, is there, uh, you just, you just, gave me another educational snip, and that's that the steelhead don't necessarily come back like salmon to their same stream. They can go anywhere they want. And yeah, uh, I mean, is, there a, is there a reason that they have to actually get as high up in the watershed as they do, and you can't create that environment or that spawning area down lower in, in the watershed? Well, as you saw in the video, they did attempt to spawn in, in that lower channel because at that point it, it was during the winter and they had scoured away all the fine sediments and there was some gravel and cobble there. But typically what happens in the lower watershed is, is one, is the oxygen levels get too low for the fish. In other words, there's, you have, uh, for whatever reason, too many nutrients being supplied from urban runoff into the stream channel or the water level just gets too low. So you have a couple of different things. You have temperature, which will affect them. If it gets too warm, um, they won't be able to survive if there's not enough oxygen in the water. And then the bug community, for whatever does get hatched, if it's not adequate to support them when they're young for the first year, then, then there's not enough food, and then they, they can die from that. And then predation in the lower watershed is easier because it's more of an open channel. They have less cover. So for all those reasons, it's a pretty difficult place for them to live. In the upper channel, you have more cover. You have colder, cooler water. It's got more oxygen. It's got a better, healthier bug community, at least from what we see in all our BMI surveys and what's typical. And um, you have better substrate that has less fine material because it's a steeper creek. That fine material is washed out during the storm events and doesn't settle there as much and less urbanization. So for all those reasons, it's better to get them higher okay. if you can. Um, and the reason I ask that, as you know, you know, I talked to you earlier this week and when we talked about a map, and I want to thank you for putting that in. You know, Lee was whispering next to me that uh, this is like the fourth time we've seen this, and it should be pretty easy. But uh, you know, I I uh, am not. I think Lee is Lee is more of a faith-based decision maker in this particular subject than I am, and I just want to tell you, I think the the report that you put together makes it really easy and abundantly clear for people who aren't faith-based steelhead people to come to the same conclusion. You know, we all get to the, we all get to, to the same place together, only some of us take a different road. And so I want to thank you for putting that map in because that's really good. And that answer too, I think could be the only other logical uh, additional contribution to the report that could have been in there. Like, why can't you do it down lower than you can up higher for people like me, right. okay? And then- um, Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. And then uh, I would like to suggest also to uh, other committee members that, uh, or to the chair, 
that I think it would be wise to uh, begin to uh, look for somebody to represent the committee at the anticipated uh, City Council presentation in January and uh, have somebody step up to uh, appear and uh, carry the flag at that time. Okay. Thanks. Okay, well noted. Mr. Moldaver. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my faith in this project is significantly based on my faith during the field trip and the two previous uh, briefings in the detail of research and discussion that the City Creek staff have had with uh, experts, not only in California, but throughout the Western states. And uh, I think the quality and focus of Mr. Johnson's report tonight uh, just give me greater uh, confidence. But so, 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 I, so I think I think the modeling uh, is there as far as we can humanly do it before we start to build. But I would also like to uh, remind people in the audience and people on the committee, as, as the chair knows, uh, that when Measure B over 10 years ago was first put forward to the community by people like Mr. Troutwine and our former colleague on the committee, Sharon Maine, one of the indicators for the success of Measure B's efforts to clean up uh, the watersheds, clean up the creeks, and clean up the water in the ocean and the beaches was to have an ecosystem where steelhead and uh, the uh, trout uh, could have a successful chance of doing this. And I think that this is actually keeping faith with the voters and keeping faith with the original intent uh, of Measure B. Uh, but I really respect the questions that Mr. Schluter and Mr. Jordan and Mr. Wilson have asked, but I'd like to point out, if, if you look carefully at the staff report or at the overheads, what we're being asked today is to recommend to the City Council that they authorize the staff to complete the negotiations with County Flood Control to move this forward. We're still going to have in the public uh, and, and people concerned about the sediment and the flow, there's going to be uh, environmental review. Uh, there's going to be the draft text of the agreement. Uh, there's going to be uh, the discussion about letting the contracts for the work for the project. We're going to have a, a lot of other uh, opportunities to ask these questions about sedimentation and uh, get better science and engineering if we have some. And I think some of the questions about the sedimentation are going to come back to us uh, through the environmental review. But for today, to have enough confidence to recommend to the City Council that they authorize the staff to uh, complete the agreement with County Flood Control to take this to the next stage, especially since, as Mr. Benson indicated, we have enthusiastic uh, uh, community partners and outside funding sources that are waiting for this to go forward. Uh, I think that we certainly have enough material uh, that we can confidently recommend this to the City Council, which is the kind of advice that they created this committee to give. Um, thank you for the comments. Uh, Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, George. It was a great, great presentation. Um, I, I don't have any questions because it was such a thorough presentation. I do have a comment in the spirit of, of um, the concerns, uh, concerns that I share in terms of um, that this is not technically a, a tried and true design um, and with regards to being faith-based and whatnot, but I think what is so extra exciting about this project is it's really a tremendous opportunity, not just for the city, um, which would, if it's successful, you know, realize a huge benefit in the return of steelhead, but, but for all of Southern California and for the state and even maybe the nation, um, to my knowledge, you know, there's these channelized creeks all over the place, and up until this point, the predominant way of restoring them was tear out the concrete and replace it with natural stones and, 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 a, and a stream channel, which is, usually, which is great, but usually prohibitively expensive, um, especially in Southern California where almost all of our creeks are channelized. If this is successful, this could be a, a fantastic case study, not just you know, for other restoration projects here, but all over as a, as a far more cost-effective way um, to implement these restoration projects, put Santa Barbara on the map. It gives us a lot of credibility that we were willing to take a chance, you know, and hopefully it will be successful. I have faith in it. And uh, that could open the door for future funding for us too, saying, hey, these guys put their money in good places. So um, my comment is just that, you know, I'm behind this. I, I think I'd be surprised if anyone else isn't, but 
Well, I think we're going to just have a few more questions because I think we're all getting to a place where we can vote on it. But I saw Mr. Wilson has a short question or comment. Mr. Schluter, you have Thanks, Chair. I was just wondering if uh, Mr. McGugan from National Marine Fisheries, NOAA Fisheries, has just a, if he would like to share a couple thoughts with us that might help us along one way or another. Don't want to put you on the spot. Um. All right, if you just introduce yourself for the record. Uh, Matt McGugan, NOAA Fisheries, National Marine Fisheries Service. Thank you. Just Fish biology. You know, just wondering if you're a cheerleader of this project. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Okay. Two, two, two. <laughs> <laughs> two. Hey, Mr. Benson. Was that an easy enough question? That was easy. Mm. Yeah. Well, you, you can tell us some Mark Capelli stories if you want. Um, yeah. Or, yeah, or we could continue on. Thanks, Matt. Thank, thank you, Mr. Benson. Chair. I, I wanted to say, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that there there is going to be risk moving forward with this project, and there is with every fish passage project that's that's been done. Uh, this is a new design. Uh, we're also looking at the the largest um, concrete channel that anyone's ever attempted a fish passage project on before. So, uh, it, it, and because of costs and so forth, it sort of necessitated a new design. This wasn't something that we did. As I mentioned earlier, we did a sort of a literature review for we also uh, have been very fortunate to have um, very able partners in this project. We've we've had engineers and biologists from the Department of Fish and Game involved in designing this project. We've had uh, engineers and biologists from the National Marine Fisheries Service involved in the design and, and modeling and testing of this project. And uh, they actually went to the warehouse, to the lab where we were testing the model and were able to work with it and, and modify the designs as we were going through. We had uh, the consultants we hired who have had extensive experience in fish passage projects on all kinds of rivers and streams and, and involving steelhead and salmon. salmon excuse me. Um, we had uh, Brian Troutwine, who, as Mr. Moldaver mentioned, has been involved in in uh, this specific stretch of Mission Creek and Fish, fish Passage uh, for gosh, 1989. So he's going on 20 years, um, and uh, and we were also working working with the Flood Control uh, District very closely. They were involved in the design. They were involved and in, in very interested in the modeling to make sure we were protecting public safety. So we had this. We had a really incredible team coming together and providing insight and, and experience and input, and um, and we arrived at we arrived at the what we think is the best design we could come up with. Uh, and our our consultant is also a consultant for the city of Goleta, and he's recommended to them that they do the same design that we came up with for this project in San Jose Creek out in Goleta, so that. Uh, that all you know, given his experience and, and his history as an engineer and as a as a uh, staff member at the Army Corps of Engineers, um, and a, a fish passage expert, gives me increased confidence and um, somewhat lowers the level of risk. But there will always be that risk there. Wonderful, Mr. Schluter. Two more quick questions. Uh, I'm not clear, George, if the speed bumps are included in Alternate Five. Yes, they are. Okay. Yep. And. Uh, lastly, uh, maybe Mr. Benson can answer. The, your last slide showed a $500,000 grant from CDFG uh, that we have applied for, but we don't know that it's available. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, in spite of my questions, I would, I would say my sentiments are exactly the same as, as uh, George's, that I think this is a fantastic project, and I'm enthusiastic to see it. Go ahead. Uh, good. I just have wonderful. I just have one question. Could you show the first map? Uh, and this one, yes, that one. You indicated that there were two uh, portions, portions uh, in the watershed that once they got up to a certain level, it would become maybe hard again for them to pass beyond them. Could you just show, for my curiosity, where the two other projects that we have, Talent Road and 192, where those are in relationship? So, here's the channel, right. And then here's about where the right. Yeah. So, so here's that's that one. Okay. And then this one is that one there. Okay. So where they split off, one 
Got it. Okay. But there's still good habitat in between these and, uh, and the right flow conditions. They could get all the way up to here, which is the dam. Sorry. Sorry, I wasn't speaking into the mic. But um, <laughs> here's, the, uh, here's the dam at the, at, the, uh, nat at the Botanic Gardens, and that is definitely an impassable barrier. Right. These other barriers here are not considered impassable. They're just right. difficult at certain flow rates. And then this is the other um, next impassable barrier beyond um, the Highway 192 bridge on Rattlesnake. So my question was basically just aimed at if this project is successful at creating habitat upstream, there's plenty of good habitat where the temperature, cover, oxygenation, right. yes. all of the things that you had talked about in why we wouldn't want it in the lower reaches, um, there's plenty of opportunity before we get to the next level of impassable or yeah, hard to pass barriers. Exactly, and, and uh, some of these other barriers are much smaller than this one, so they would be easier to remove, uh, not as right. difficult and cheaper. And then here, about here is where we actually have in this section still, I mean, trout living right now. So if, mm -hmm. if trout can live there, then definitely right. the offspring of the steelhead could live and there. And then just to look ahead from the uh, channelized portion to Talent Road. Is that good habitat there? Well, it's it's rated as I think moderate here, but no, it because it doesn't have year-round water. So, so, so realistically, if we see that this is successful, we would want to get going pretty quickly on Talent. Road. And Talent is would actually relatively, relatively easy if it, if it goes as scheduled would be constructed before the channel was completed. Right, 2010. Okay, wonderful. Those are all of my questions. I think. We call, call the question, Mr. Chair. And I am going to ask for a vote. All in favor of the motion, aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion passes unanimously. That, that being the order of business for the day, I would like to take this opportunity to wish everyone on the committee, all the staff, and anyone else who's uh, watching, a happy holidays and a good new year. And it looks like we had one more comment from... Mr. Benson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Jordan mentioned, uh, uh, asked a question of whether the committee wanted to uh, uh, designate someone to appear at City Council on January 13th, and, and our, um, our committee bylaws state that the chair or vice chair can, can appear on behalf of the committee, but if, you'd like, but if the committee would like to appoint somebody else, uh, you need to do that at a at a regularly scheduled meeting, which is tonight, and you could you could appoint a different person. We are going to have a change in in the chair. We will have a new vice chair being elected at our January meeting. Um, February so meeting usually. I, I think we're going to do it. At, I think we're going to do it. At, well, we could do it either one. We'll talk about the, yeah. the agenda. Um, so I don't know if if the committee wants to designate someone tonight right. or and uh, what or is the date the of that city chair. council? It's, uh, Tuesday, January 13th. 13th. And even though we don't have that specifically listed on the agenda, would this vote be covered under the item that we're discussing? It, it's the same item. I, I mean, know. the okay. chair, the vice chair. So is anyone interested up. in representing the, the committee's point of view? Uh, if Mr. Chair, um, if this comes up before you move on to a uh, charter commission, uh, in your next public service life, I would have tremendous confidence in you representing the committee. And if not, uh, God willing, uh, I will be glad to uh, go in your stead on January 13th. All right. So that sounds like it's taken care of. Any Anything else that we are allowed to talk about? So I look for a uh, motion from the committee. So moved. We have, it's actually not on our agenda. So we can... Um, it's in the packet, but not on the. But did you mention in the agenda? Can we talk about calendar? No, uh, I did. I did distribute the calendar. I think at the last meeting, uh, we, was it the last meeting or two meetings ago? We distributed the the 2009 calendar, and I believe we're scheduled for uh, January 14th, the day after the council meeting. Okay. So since I didn't actually hear the previous motion, which is why we. 
didn't act on it. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. We have a motion to adjourn. A second? Second. Without objection, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.